Okay, hey, I want to say something before I start. Y'all have been great, very engaged in conversation, and this has been a fantastic group of people. I mean, the late night talks and hearing these guys talk about what they're doing, I mean, it's this is a really engaged group. So uh, this is a picture of my family uh, before we add another one to our herd. So we got three now. Uh, that's my son, Jax, and my daughter, Emma, and my wife, Kayla. Uh, you know, this is really my context of why I want to farm. You know, I come from a big farm family, but I kind of knew that there wasn't really going to be a complete place for me there. But I wanted to farm, so I pursued my dream, and I want to leave something for my son and my, for my girls if they'd like to farm. So here's my background. Uh, I'm in Jasper, which is 30 miles north of Joplin, so like Colton said, about 98 miles from here. Uh, I farm 650 acres, and I've got 80 cow-calf pairs, and I'm happy to say that I own them now. <laughs> uh, I custom graze another 150 cow-calf pairs. Uh, that brings us, that's about a third of my income a year. And I graze some cattle on perennial pastures, but most on cover crops. I've got some laying hens. I would like to make the joke that my laying hens are a nonprofit organization. <laughs> I don't make a lot of money on that, but I enjoy it. And then I also peddle some cover crops even inside. So how I got started, uh, the farm I have now, I inherited, and it was passed down from my great grandpa Dean right there. And my dad there in the middle passed away when I was 19, and I was able to inherit that first 60 acres. So I started off with 60, I'm at 650 now, and I have an opportunity to maybe run another 350 in this next coming year. So on my farm, I really, like Keith was talking about, and Darren, I really try to focus on principles. I don't focus on practices or products. And what I mean by that is I don't really get too caught up in interseeding and certain things like that and relay cropping. I know that that's trendy and a lot of guys like that stuff, but let's not get away from what's really important, which is the principles. When we focus on soil, the products, that doesn't make soil. The principles do. Planting the cover crop, yes, it's a product, but that has to be part of the principle system. So I'm not going to go over the principles very much, but they are the most important part. And so you're going to see them all here. And all of those right there are what we really need to focus on our farms if we want to be profitable. I'm going to show my farm economics of some of the things I've done. I've had, I've had better yields on some farms. I've had more profitable acres of some, of some acres, but... I just really want to show what we can do. So I started no-tilling in 2012. Uh, that's my boy, Jax. Again, um, I started with soybeans. That's the simplest thing to no-till. No-tilling soybeans is a no-brainer. It just works. It doesn't fail. It just works. Uh, the soybeans in that picture made 54 bushel, and I'm okay with my son standing out in my fields. I don't have any post-application sprays in my farms. So my kids can go out there in my fields or anyone else, and I feel completely comfortable with where they're at. My first cover crop was in 2013. It was a prevent plant situation. Uh, the previous year, I went to an organic conference, and they were talking about cover crops, and I got inspired. So happened that we had a really wet summer. At the time, I was raising double crop beans. I planted a cover crop, and it got pretty big. I mean, those radishes were pretty crazy. <laughs> I uh, strip tilled some corn in there, and this is kind of what we got. So 2016, the biggest thing in my area, everybody says, okay, you can no-till corn or soybeans, but you can't no-till corn. So I no-tilled corn. This wasn't into a cover, but this was from the previous year, wheat and double crop beans. Once again, I was still in that wheat, double crop, bean, corn rotation, if you call it a rotation. No cover crops between there. Uh, they said it couldn't be done, and maybe to an extent they were right. Everyone else's corn around me made 120, and mine barely pushed over 90. And I was doing everything by the books that the university was telling me to do. I was putting on all the nitrogen I needed to put on, multiple applications of fungicides, insecticides, ne you know, neonics on my corn, doing the whole nine yards, and it wasn't making me money. I lost my rented farm, uh, so I was having to do a lot of work on the sides to make my farm pay. I, I found this in a bathroom one time, so I take a picture. <laughs> I have no idea who Jillian Michaels is, but when I failed, you know, I read this. It's not about perfect, it's about effort. And that per first part there is really key because none of us are going to be perfect by any means. But we just have to keep trying to do our best. And what's so great about soil is God gives us the foundation to look at soil. Look at the native prairies, you know, the timber. We've all talked about that, and I'm sure we've all heard that. That's what we need to focus on. Try to have biomimicry, mimic nature. So... <laughs> I'm kind of like this, I was kind of like this cow. 
I wasn't making very much money. So I was stuck and I had to change. I happened to meet these guys right here, Ray, and, uh, Ray Archuleta and Gabe Brown. They changed my life, 100%. I could not have done this without these guys because I'm not smart enough. Gabe, I, the first time I heard him on a YouTube video, I thought, this guy doesn't know crap about farming. Turn that off. Two or three months later, I was still researching about how to get no-till to pay because I couldn't afford tillage to put in the course. And Ray was talking, and he mentioned Gabe Brown again. And I said, man, that name sounds familiar. So I Googled Gabe Brown, and the second time I heard him talk, it all just clicked with me. So I was 100% committed by fall of 2016. Finances were tight, and I started changing dramatic changes on my farm if I wanted to farm. Double crop soybeans, gone. We don't need greedy soybeans, greedy beans. Every acre was covered, and I've been that way since 2016. If there's not a cash crop growing, there's a cover crop growing. Uh, I stress my rotation. I no longer have this two-year rotation of wheat, double crop beans, corn. There's other crops. <laughs> there's a lot of crops out there. I adjusted planting dates. I started planting soybeans earlier in April, and I started planting my corn later in May to maximize nitrogen production from legumes. Because when your, when your legumes bloom, they've essentially hit peak nodulation. I changed my maturities on the corns. I went with shorter corn maturities. I went with longer soybean maturities planted earlier. I created a farm budget. This was key. <laughs> my wife was not very happy with where we were financially, and the bank wasn't either. Um, so I had, to change, I had to make a farm budget, start realizing what I was actually inputting on my farm, and start understanding what I was losing on my farm. Diversified my cash crops, and I started building fence. On all the land I own now, at 650 acres, I own everything but around 100 acres. Well, I'm partners with the bank. <laughs> uh, so we started building fence. On every, on every farm but one, I have fence on now to graze livestock. And this, it's, a, it's a cheap fence system. Two high tensile wire fiberglass posts. It's not in a fancy system. You know, one, I know one water source is, isn't ideal, but that's what I've got. And I became intentional. I started thinking about things differently. I wasn't just going to go with the normal. I started, I started, I became intentional. That's very important. And then I went to daily moves with cattle. And that has been the biggest bottom line for my, my livestock production. You know, I truly feel like a fifth grade, a fifth grader can tell me more about how an ecosystem works than most farmers. We as farmers think that we need to use, you know, this NEMA strike to take care of the nematode. But we're causing all these problems after that. When we make a decision on our farm, it impacts everything. You know, I'm gonna steal one from Dr. Alan Williams. Everything we do has compounding and cascading effects. Regenerative practice to save my farm, and this is how I make them work. Every acre has been planted green since 2018. Where I'm at in Southwest Missouri, we get a crap ton of rain <laughs> in the spring. We're wet. So my covers, I let them take up moisture. They're pulling moisture out of the soil so I can plant my cash crops. This is what it looks like after I plant. Uh, this is ideal for me. This is what I want to plan into. And for the most part, I don't really have anything special in my planner. Now, I'm totally with Keith and some of them on, on some of the attachments and stuff, but I have a very basic planner and drill. My, my drill is a 9411 drill. I've got a, a portable tractor that I can run. This right here, I just want to show you something here. This is some research that's been done about the cost of tillage and then no-tilling. I'm going to call baloney on the top part there because the no-tilling actually costs less per acre because I can look at my fuel consumption, and if I do custom planting or help another farmer plant their crops, I can see their fuel consumption on conventional ground compared to the no-till ground. And that $19.90 that $19 an acre on a tillage pass is so true. Because just think about it. You have another tractor, you have a dish, you have a digger, you have a rolling basket, you have a chisel, you have all this equipment, right? All this steel. And you're always setting that money back aside to buy the next piece. So are you really putting that money back in your pocket? Guys tell me, oh, I have my turbo till paid for. And I always ask them, are you gonna buy another one? And the answer is, when this one's wore out. So you're putting that money back aside. So that has to go in your cost per, per acre, as well as your insurance on that. Taxes, your fuel consumption, machinery wear and tear. It gets expensive, folks, really expensive. That's my fall tillage. <laughs> Annual ryegrass, everyone thinks you need brassicas though to break compaction. You want your grasses first. Those grasses can find those micropores and expand them out. 
if you have a big tuber like that, that's a good indication that he probably hit some compaction. So I just wanted to show that. Most people think that you want to alleviate compaction. Brassicas are the complete way to go. No, you need the grasses in there. Uh, this was a storm we got in 2018. Uh, the picture, these fields are right across the road from each other. If anybody ever wants to come tour my farm, I'll show you where these are at. Top right picture, if you want to raise catfish, that's a good place to do it. That chiseled ground. If you want to infiltrate some water, that's how we do that, okay? That, that right there is big. That was a warm season cover crop mix that I grazed, went back to a cool season mix to go back to cattle. Now you might be wondering how I make that financial pay. I'm going to talk about that a little bit later. Okay, worms. This is the first time Ray come to my farm, and he's like, Mac, you got so many worms. And you know how Ray is. We both have ADHD, I'm pretty sure, so conversations between me and Ray, they get pretty wild. <laughs> worm castings. This is an analysis on some worm castings. If you notice, what's the largest piece in that? Carbon. Okay, we're going to come back to that too. There's quite a bit of stuff that revolves around carbon. Also, look at the percentage of nitrogen, potash, phosphorus, calcium. Here's a five-year study done by Joe Lauer. I probably mistaked his name, probably said his name wrong, but this is showing the importance of diversity. Remember I said I stretched my rotation. I've got a lot of cover crops growing, right? Okay, so if you look at the bottom there, okay, just from a corn soybean, just by adding wheat to the rotation, this is without cover crops. These would be higher, in my opinion, with cover crops. But this is without cover crops. By stretching the rotation from corn to soybeans to corn, soybeans, wheat, look at the increase. And this is a 10-year study. This isn't just a one-year study. So we look as diversity increases and our rotation gets better. Look at wheat yields over there. The wheat's the green on, on your guys' right. Uh, I mean, wheat on wheat, 30 bushel, corn, soybean, wheat. The wheat falling after the legume. Okay, so here's some of my diversity on my farm. I probably missed a few things, but I typed this up last night as quick as I could. I raised a lot of different cash crops. Like Keith was saying, cool season and warm season crops. Uh, the cover crop species there, you know, just try out what works on your farm. I'm not too far away from y'all, so probably a lot of stuff I use can work on your farms. And nobody's really talked about this, but understand your resource, what you're trying to accomplish with a cover crop, I'll say that. So you know whether well, that's nitrogen fixation, erosion control, really, really try to understand what you're trying to do with the cover crop. This is another part about becoming intentional, right? Grazing. I like to say this, the key to no-tills cover crops and the key to cover crops is cattle. Because if you want to turn those covers into cash, that's the way to do it. Here's some, uh, this is how we can save on MP and K. I've reduced my MP and K by about 80% of my farm, okay? Uh, Doug and I were talking about yesterday about some phosphorus and stuff. The more we learn about these things we're inputting on our farms, it's, it's pretty scary stuff, guys. Uh, and we can, we can do this. And I'm going to show you how I do this, how, I, how I've reduced. These are just a few ways how cover crops, the, the main key component is here is a living root. Okay, that's the key component. You know, we talked about the root exudates coming out right. That's a very key component, the living root. And then also maximize biomass. Let the cover crops grow. If you're planting and cover crops are this tall, it's going to take 10 years for you to get, gain 1% organic matter in our environment. If you're planting cover crops this tall, you just set it up five times because it's fast. Okay? And also, think about the amount of nutrients in them. That biomass is nutrients. And as that's decaying down, that's going to be returned back to your cash crop as well. Um, I don't believe anybody's talked about carbon nitrogen ratios. I'm going to plug this in real fast. Very important, understand, going to corn, you want a low carbon nitrogen ratio because you're wanting that nitrogen to be returned back to the corn quickly. So I like to be on my farm, I want to be around a 40 to 1 carbon nitrogen ratio when I'm planting, but for some of you guys getting started out, let's keep that lower even than that because you're wanting those nutrients to be returned back. A high carbon type cover crop would be like cereal rye, it's about 80 to 1 at full stage, and then a low uh, carbon nitrogen ratio cover crop would be hairy vetch. So hairy vegetable decays a lot faster than fully mature cereal rye. Nature is powerful. Uh, this is off my grandfather's farm. Uh, this has been hayed since he believes fought the Civil War, but my family's owned it since the 30s. It's never had any synthetic fertilizer applied on it. It's had lime applied on it a few times. And every single year, it produces the same tonnage. Now do the math. How many, how many years 
where they pulling nutrients off that and it's still producing. And think about prairie species, very fungal dominant species, right? Okay, so let's start using fungal dominant species and our cover crop as well, oats, barley, legumes, things like that. They can break down rocks. So here's the honey test results off that. I, want, I pulled the honey test, like I wanna see what's in this, in this prairie soil. It got a soil health score of 25. On my farm, I'm an eight right now. So that's pretty dang good. Uh, percent MAC, organic matter is 3.9%. Our row crop ground in our area is easily 1.82%. That's, that's pretty common. Uh, there's the nutrient value. This is the nutrient. So I took, I cut some prairie hay. I went and sent, sent off a nutrient sample of that. That's what's in the prairie itself, the tissues of, of the prairie. And then that right there shows what it's deficient in. It's high in calcium. Okay, think about that too. We've got a lot of limestone rocks. <laughs> I say that's the reason why, but everything else in it is deficient. According to all the tests, we're deficient in everything. But now how's it producing the same biomass every single year? Okay, so grandpa bought this in 1934. I cannot, or my great grandpa Dean did, I'm sorry. In 1934, and my grandpa Mac inherited this. He believes it was hay since the Civil War, probably in bundles. We're not 100% sure, but we do know it's been hay since 1934. <laughs> so really, how much fertilizer do we need? Now that you kind of see that, start thinking about your row crop ground. Because hay is a high removal situation, and that's happening every single year. That, that's removing a lot of nutrients. So here's a good buddy of mine, uh, Dr. Buzz Clue. He did a study, uh, 420 uh, pounds of K2O applied in a three year, this is a three year study, not super long, but it, it gives you the idea. Look at the zero application rates here. Wow, the corn in 2016 yielded higher. That's weird. I'm pretty sure every, almost every agronomist will tell you that can't happen. But why is that? On these farms here, Buzz was mimicking nature, using cover crops between his cash crops constantly. He wasn't even grazing these. So we can do better things with grazing. In the average cow fat, there's 0.24 pounds of nitrogen, 0.18 uh, pounds of P, and 0.24 uh, pounds of K. Uh, so taking all this in, I just wanted to just try it, okay? So this is, uh, this is what I call the weedy beans. It was not a prescription cover crop, but I had a bunch of weeds that were grown on this farm. Johnson grass and pig weeds this tall that I planted into, okay? Uh, so... There's no such thing as weeds. I took tissue samples on the weeds out there. This is eye-opening. Look at pig weeds, okay? 35.8 parts per million borum. All of these quote-unquote weeds are bringing something to your system. And guess what, guys? Cows will eat every one of those. I've seen them. So... You can just see the difference in the plants. Your soil is trying to cure itself. These annual weeds are trying to tell you what you need on your farm and what's wrong with your farm. Now, I know we all want to go out there and spray every bit of Johnson grass we can and spray every pig weed we can. But if you've just got, I'm, I'm not saying leave weeds out there, but I'm just saying really think about not only the economics, but the ecological effects of going out there and spraying, let's say, extend, right, on all these pig weeds you have. If they're not at an economically devastating threshold, then why are we spraying? Just really evaluate that. Who cares if your neighbor thinks that, oh man, he's not thinking silly, he's got like eight weeds out there. Who cares? <laughs> so here's some of my economics. I hope your alls are better than mine. Uh, I, put, I put everything I could think of on these. So I've got my land payment, $140 an acre. Property tax. I put in miscellaneous expenses because that goes into my handy soil test. That goes into if I grab a tube of grease for a piece of equipment. If I just, I just put that in there just as safe security if I forget something, because I, I obviously forget stuff. Crop insurance to cover crop seed on that farm was zero dollars, so it was weeds I was telling you about. Uh, zero MP and K, I didn't apply any MP and K on there. And since I've owned that farm, I've now applied no MP and K on there since I've had it. Uh, $22 for my non GMO soybeans. I raise all non GMO soybeans. Uh, non-GMO corn, I don't need them on my operation. I don't have any neonics on my corn and soybeans. I, I've, I've eliminated that from my, my program. You can find those non-GMO numbers out there, okay? If you guys could take just one thing off of this, look up the Indices Foundation about neonics on corn, and I hope that changes some hearts and some minds. 
I planted green, I put that at $20 an acre. How I put those prices in is I take custom grazing rates in, or custom application rates in my area and I put that into my bottom line. Because even though my tractor and my drill are paid off, I, I just wanna make sure I'm covering all the bases. Herbicide pass, $25, that's gonna be eliminated because I have a roller crimper on some of this stuff. Uh, combining hauling, $35. And I only sold those soybeans, non gmo soybeans at the time for $11, which was, which was a pretty decent price at the time. Net income's $208. I've raised higher yielding beans. I've raised 62 bushel beans. I've raised more profitable beans. But what I wanna show you with this is we can raise soybeans and corn with not as much fertility. Your fertility can come in different ways. Your cover crop residue breaking down, you know, like I talked about. Let biomass, get biomass out there. And also we're giving the wild lesson to you on. <laughs> I had a buddy send, send me this on his deer camera. That's some sewer right underneath them. Um, I've got some pretty darn good deer on my farms. So, you know, this right here, this is a Daniel Heons on my, I call my mom's farm. That's the one I heard from my dad. He shot some big deer on that farm. And he says, he hunts a lot of places. He says, Mac, there's not very many deer like this around our county. Uh, also had a buddy this year shoot two does on me. He said, those are the fattest does I've ever seen. So those are pretty big compliments from these hunter guys. Okay, switching gears a little bit here. Uh, this is what I utilize on my farm, adapted multi paddock grazing. To me, it's the best description of how to graze in nature's image, okay? What I mean by that is with adapted multi paddock grazing, we're not getting set in set stock density. I'm moving the cattle daily. I don't keep the cattle in the same rotation every single, like, you know, they're not going to be here in 30 days and 40 year, in 40 days or whatever. I'm looking at my forages and I'm adjusting to that. I'm being very adaptive. Nature is not stagnant. Nature is constantly changing. Let's not try to get, let's try to get out of a rotation. And guys, God gave cows four legs, not standard hay bug. They're out there to graze, okay? I've got a few different ways you can do that. There's uh, grazing some stalks. Um, I don't have this part memorized, but in 150 bushel corn, there's 100 pounds of nitrogen, 37 pounds of phosphorus, and 145 pounds of potash in just the residue. And most of your phosphorus is in the corn cob. Everyone wants to talk about removals. A lot of that's being cycled back, okay? We're not removing as much as we actually think we are. Um, so yeah, I mean, a lot of different ways. This is, uh, this is some stockpiled fescue, you know, pasture. Not as much as I'd like to see, but that's, that's January. We're getting a little thinner by then. Uh, over in the top right hand corner, that's a million pound stock density. Uh, th these right here are my South Pole cows. I, I, I like South Poles on, right now I feel like South Poles are probably the best, best genetic animal. Um, and, and then, you know, like I said, grazing stocks. So with these high stock density grazings, these cows will start eating things that we thought they would never eat. They act different. Nature sometimes can be a tad bit competitive. So I took away mineral from my cows for six months, and I noticed when I put them in these high stock density grazing that the consumption of weeds was going up. They would go out there and they would mow a thistle down. Okay, thistles do a good job of bringing iodine up from the soil. I don't know if they were after iodine in the thistle. I'm not sure. Uh, dandelions bring calcium up pretty well, but they were they were attacking those weeds. And I would stand from me to the screen here, and the cow would be chomping down on a thistle. Over in this other picture here, uh, you can see how I move my cows, just like Doug was talking about. We do it with poly wires. It's super simple to unroll a poly wire. Um, it takes me about 15 to 20 minutes. I don't have huge long quarter mile stretches though. I've got uh, a perimeter uh, high tensile wire going down the center of my farm, so that way I can branch off both sides of the water tanks underneath that. That makes sense. And then also, there's my fly control. Uh, see the dragonflies? I don't use any fly control mineral. I don't use any porons, and I never have. I was kind of ignorant when it come into the cattle thing. I didn't know I was supposed to do all this stuff. I've never vaccinated for black leg. I've never done that stuff, and I really haven't had any issues. Knock on wood. <laughs> Uh, do we really need to feed hay for six months? I know guys in my area that are big established farmers and they start feeding in October and don't get done until March. Is that making any money? I mean, seriously. I don't own any hay equipment either. I buy my hay and import those nutrients onto my farm. Is that where you guys want your meat to come from, your beef to come from? Yummy. 
That looks delicious. So that's the standard practice in Southwest Missouri of how to feed hay. You get that area next to a creek and you just feed a bunch of hay there. This is the way I feed hay. Now this year I fed seven bales of hay to 80 cows that I own. And I did that by grazing my covers. And the only reason I even fed those seven bales was because of the minus 22 we had with the ice. I wouldn't have fed those seven if it wasn't because of that. But if I got to feed hay, I'm going to think smarter, not harder. Let's predetermine where we're going to put our hay out and let's bale graze. So here's some economics of my bale grazing. I pay a neighbor, I paid a neighbor a dollar a bale to come set out my 80 bales. This was last year. I wouldn't have fed this much hay last year if I wouldn't have got stuck with some custom grazing animals 30 days longer than I wanted to. But anyways, average cost of $35 a bale. I paid him a dollar a bale to come set them out because I don't have a loader on my tractor. And so he made $20 an hour because that's about how long it took him. He made $80. I fed those 80 bales. The total cost is $2,800 for 80 cows. Cattle winter feed co cost is $36 a head. How I do that is super simple. I got one poly wire set up. I take the poly wire over, hop it over, set it on the next bale, and my cows go to the next bale. It's really quick and easy. It's simple. Um, and like I said, it will be less in the future. I, I truly feel like in our environment here, in the southern environment, we can go 365 days without feeding any hay. So I like to turn covers into cash. Uh, the best way to do that is through the cow. Uh, here's 2019, grazing uh, some warm season covers. Now this year I didn't have enough stock density. That year I didn't have enough stock density. Or I didn't have a high enough stocking rate to keep up with forage. It got out of hand. You don't want to graze stuff to try to put on pounds, but that's mature. You want to graze stuff that's about like this you're trying to put on pounds. But uh, I took that picture because it's like a jungle out there. I don't know how tall it was, but the Egyptian wheat and the sorghums, they were pretty well dominant. I got to say, uh, understand what your next cash crop is too, what you're going to, because it's very important. I've got legumes in there that you can't see, and that, that field there went to corn. Um, so, you know, the sun imp, it's not bloomed out at that time, but there is sun imp cowpeas and different things like that in there to balance the CDN ratio. So here's some pretty basic economics of how I, you know, how I do custom grazing. Doug Peterson gave me the best advice, always have a contract, because I got stuck with cows for 30 days longer than I wanted to, and I had to feed a lot of hay to my own cows, did not make money on that deal. I charge a dollar per animal per day. I like to graze cows with newborn calves on them because that 60 pound, 70 pound calf is still worth a dollar, just like that cow. So it's essentially $2 a cow. And I always charge $2 a bull, steers and, steers and heifers. I'm around $1.40. And we weigh these animals in at my local co-op on, on the scales, and then we weigh them out. So if you wanna sell this to somebody, sell these registered guys pounds, because they're all about pounds. You know, some of these registered breeders of like the Angus and stuff like that, they're about pounds. So sell them pounds, don't sell them your forage, and show them that with data. Weigh them in, graze them, weigh them off. That's how I do it. And then there's just, uh, so I put so I, 74 head for 93 days on 59 acres, $6,882, which is about $116 uh, gross. So I put, that's another $100 an acre. I don't have $16 an acre in expenses, but I just want to show you that you can add another $100 an acre to your even corn soybean crop or rotation just by grazing livestock. Pretty good money. Uh, highly productive soils, we went this yesterday, tend to have a fungal to bacteria ratio of one to one. When I first got cattle, my, my row crop land was the first time I'd seen mushrooms. I, I'd never seen mushrooms and they were popping up like everywhere. There's something that happens in the rumen and I've actually never took a cow pat sample to see what the fungal bacteria ratio is, but I say it's pretty darn good. Okay, so Austin Campbell, he's from Missouri. He did this study here, and I want to show you why no tilling isn't good enough, why we need cover crops. Look at the percent increase in moisture in the tissue samples compared from no till to cover crops 41% increase in the moisture. 41% increase. That's pretty huge. Okay, that was those are corn tissue samples and soybean tissue samples. Just by having the crop, cover crop underneath there, you have 44% more water. That's huge. I, I think are y'all in about 36 rainfall environment here in Iola? I'm in about a 44, 42, 44. Um, so 
but we still get kind of dry, you know, the rain comes in the spring and fall, and we get a little bit dry in the summer, but let's capture, let's capture that moisture, let's keep that moisture. So here's 2020, this is where we're at now, I told you guys I failed at no-till corn, I, this year I'm, I finally got it to work where I felt like, okay, I'm doing better. So we had over 40 inches of rain until June 3rd this year, then it cut off till October 20th, not a zero, from June 3rd to October, to October 20th. That corn on your left had over 20 inches of rain on it. The corn on the right, and I'm not going to tell you whose is whose, but the corn on the right, it had three inches on it after it was planted. Okay, is there a visible, a visible difference? These farms here are less than a third of a mile away. Same soil type, different growing conditions. Here's the economics on this. I'm not going to go over everything there, but if you see anything I missed, let me know. I do have a litter cost in there. Litter, in my opinion, is just as bad as effect fertilizer if we use it too much. I've seen some I've seen some soil samples of 450 parts per million phosphorus. Now your fungal hyphae and stuff can't function as well as they, they need to with that much phosphorus in your soil. It's not a race, guys. We're not trying to have this big number on P and K. That's a bad thing. We need balance. Uh, $399 total cost production. Once again, I raised non-GMO corn. That's why my seed cost is probably cheaper than most, $39 an acre. Um, I'm not planting super high populations. I, I'm not big in the interseeding thing, guys, to be honest with you. That's, that's a practice. I think there's a great place for it up north. The reason I don't believe in it is because if you can tell me that that three-inch tall annual ryegrass is capturing as much sunlight as another corn plant right next to it, I would highly disagree with you. Um, net income was $401 an acre. This year, I had a farm net almost close to, <laughs> I had a farm net over $1,000 an acre. The corn made 160 bushels to the acre, and everyone else in my area was picking 60 and 80 bushel corn. So that was a difference, almost twice as good. I'm not going to say I can do this every year, but that thatch, that residue, that two-inch residue underneath there is how I make that work. That's my soil in my right hand. That's the soil on the left. Those soils are five feet apart. Is there a difference? A little bit visible difference. Why is that soil darker? Carbon. Remember, look, think about the worm casting, 26% carbon. Think about those tissue samples, anywhere from 35 to 45% carbon. Let me ask you a question. This is how we treat our row crop bills, and let's put it in the perspective of our body. If I give you a vitamin pill and it has every essential nutrient you need, can you live off that one little pill? No one's gonna answer? Okay. Answer's no. You can't live off that little pill. Why is that? It has every nutrient we need. We're putting every nutrient we need in our body. We're missing the main one, folks. Carbon. Carbon is the largest percentage. Okay? Organic matter. We all talk about organic matter. I hope this is something you all have heard. Organic matter is approximately 50 to 58% carbon. Okay? Plants release carbon in the soil. We'll keep a living plant there as long as we can. There's my phone number. There's my name. If you don't know how to spell it, add me on Facebook if you want to follow me. Come to my farm. I have an open-door policy on my farm. I'd love to show you my farm. Thank you. Thank you.